Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to WEMO's virtual side event, Real Health Assembly side event called Regional Production for Equitable Access to Medicines, Do's and Don'ts. My name is Ella Weggen and I'll be moderating this event. I work as a senior global health advocate for WEMOS Foundation in the Access to Medicines team. WEMOS is a global health foundation based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, working on realizing health justice through lobbying and advocacy. <clears throat> we, fo we focus on three thematic areas, being finance for health, human resources for health, and access to medicines. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Access to Medicines team of WEMOS has focused a lot on increasing technology transfer, for instance, through CTEP, the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, and the mRNA Hub. In November last year, WEMOS published an evaluation report of CTEP with concrete recommendations for the World Health Organization, the EU, and national governments. Also to look for how this uh, sharing mechanism can be used for future pandemic response. Yesterday, we published a position paper called Eyes on the Price, Regional Production of Medicines to Achieve Health Equity, Sovereignty and Self-Reliance, which uh, I will share in the chat in a minute, or a colleague of mine will share, if you did not have the chance to see it. I uh, ask you not to read it now, but because my colleague Antonio will uh, go through it in his presentation. During this event, different experts in the field will discuss the policy environment that is needed to create regional manufacturing that contributes to equitable access to medical products, specifically for low and middle income countries. The speakers will discuss the role of the World Health Organization and governments on facilitating local manufacturing of pharmaceutical products that promote sovereignty, self-reliance and self-sufficiency. The overarching question that we posed to the different speakers in advance was what are the barriers and opportunities in making sure that increased regional manufacturing capacity will facilitate health equity, self-reliance and sovereignty? We will have one and a half hour in total for this event and on the screen uh, you can see the agenda for today. We will start sharing it now. We are very glad with the excellent speakers that were willing to give uh, their perspectives on this question. And we will start with an introduction to the topic from my colleague Antonio Perelli. Um, then the first part of the event will be from a more regional perspective with speakers, uh, with the CEO from the South African biotech company Evergen, I mean Evergen, and the director general of an NGO called Afiana Haki based in Uganda. The second part will be from a global perspective with UNITAID and the World Health Organization as speakers. The speakers each will have about 10 minutes to give their presentation. We want to make sure we have enough time for discussion, questions and answers in the final half hour of the event. At exactly five o'clock, I want to make sure we can end the event and therefore I may might be a bit strict for the speakers in, in my time management. So without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague Antoni Antonio Perelli, who is conducting a, uh, an evaluation on regional manufacturing capacity, as well as working closely together with partners in Rwanda and uh, neighboring countries on the study. Antonio, please go ahead. You have the floor. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Ella. I hope you can see the screen that I'm still sharing. Uh, so first and foremost, thank you very much for joining this uh, conversation um, on, on uh, regional production for equitable access to medicines and for being here. This is a very hot topic uh, right now, very high on the agenda on the decision makers. And of course, we want to know um, a little bit more about it and we want to get into, into detail. So um, let me start by saying my name is Antonio Perrelli. I'm part of the Access to Medicines team. I'm a global health advocate at the Venice. Um, then let's start with a little bit of what we uh, will focus on today. So what will be discussed today? Uh, we will start with a rationale for the increased uh, regional manufacturing. Uh, then we will uh, move on to um, actions that have been taken and have been put in place to achieve regional manufacturing uh, 
uh, in the world, then we will look at what makes uh, regional manufacturing actually regional. So the, 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 the criteria by which we can judge if regional manufacturing is actually delivering on local needs, then we will see how these objectives um, are deliverable. And of course, what's next on the agenda and what are we doing as well as so let me start with the rationale. The rationale is actually quite simple because as we can see, we can split the rationale in two parts, the pre-COVID era and the after COVID outbreak uh, era. So before we notice an insufficient production of medicines in low and middle income countries, of course, this doesn't mean that there was no capacity. We are talking about production, not capacity uh, of production. And of course, this is uh, the status quo. This is, the, uh, as a matter of fact, a situation which existed, existed before COVID. But there was no consensus bef before COVID uh, among uh, UN agencies and uh, other international organizations, as well as as well as CSOs, on the fact that more regional manufacturing was needed. But then uh, we noticed also the unequal scramble of COVID nineteen vaccines, which changed a little bit uh, the way we are conceiving local manufacturing and the way we are uh, putting it as the backbone of um, of a renewed global health governance model. So. Of course, there are many actions that have been put in place to achieve uh, greater regional manufacturing, if not to um, make it happen in some parts of the world in which uh, the, 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 the supplies were, uh, as in Africa, for example, the African continent, which supplied less than 1% of its vaccine doses. So what are the main actions? We will start by uh, looking at the WHA resolution 74.6, uh, from 2021 this resolution is very important because it's highlighting the high uh, commitment of political leaders and member states um, to strengthen local manufacturing and uh, medicines and other health technologies to improve the access uh, around the world and of course this uh, is also um, very important because um, uh, it is very topical with the progress report that probably professor uh, Tara Blanche would uh, illustrate a bit more uh, into details and then we have a second element, which is the medicine patent pool uh, and the COVID-19, um, the CTAP, the COVID-19 uh, technology. Um, um, so, for example, um, they are both sharing uh, mechanisms set up by the WHO and both um, involves companies that can share, uh, voluntarily share the data, the knowledge and the IP. So, um, as for the COVID-19 technology access pool, um, we also issued a report as uh, WEMOS on, uh, on it, and we are looking into how this mechanism can further provide and should be used in uh, future pandemics preparedness and response. Uh, it could be, for example, called a PTAP in the future, so a pandemic technology access pool instead of CTAP. Uh, then we have a very important initiative at the um, African level, for example, because uh, there are, of course, global initiatives, regional initiatives, but they are coordinated towards the same objectives, which is boosting uh, regional manufacturing. Um, of course, uh, this partnership is very important because um, it is the result of the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the African Union work and is working on multiple dimensions, such as the business environment, the R&D environment, technology transfer and access to sustainable finance. Then we have, of course, the mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub, which is uh, a very, very important initiative, very crucial initiative, and it's uh, unique in a way because it's the only initiative which is actually um, building capacity in low income countries to produce mRNA vaccine through a center of excellence and training with Afrigen in South Africa and then delivering it at a wider level, working with many spokes around the world. Um, and then we could also mention the Team Europe MAV Plus initiative. So the, um, the initiative for manufacturing and access to vaccines, medicines and health technology, which is um, delivering an ambitious um, uh, on its ambitious goals um, with 1 billion uh, of commitments, around 1 billion of commitment. And it has set a collaboration, which is really wide, 360 degrees collaboration to boost local manufacturing capacities in Africa and strengthening pharmaceutical systems, regulatory environment, and uh, much more. Of course, the, uh, these are just uh, examples of uh, the, 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 the many actions that have been uh, put in place to boost uh, regional manufacturing. Now that we have seen how many initiatives uh, we have already set um, uh, worldwide, we need to understand how can we evaluate the efficiency, but also 
um, the other aspects which are really important uh, to understand and which are the dimensions through which we can analyze these initiatives. A first dimension for Vemos is the health equity profile. Then we have the sovereignty and then we have self-reliance. Of course, there is an overlapping, as you can see, there are some areas in which health equity means also self-reliance and sovereignty and so on. But let's take a closer look to every each element. Here we have health equity and uh, we are trying because uh, it, it's sometimes, um, it is three terms which are sometimes used interchangeably. So it's important to clarify somehow to what extent we mean what. So health equity means that low and middle income countries have access to medicines um, to the same extent uh, as high income countries. So there is some sort of um, balance between countries uh, worldwide, which needs to be reached. Of course, it is something that we know, but it's important to keep that in mind to measure uh, how these initiatives are delivering. Then we have once uh, this level of access is reached between countries, we have the problem of making um, the, 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 uh, to, to make the outreach to the communities and, of course, eliminating access barriers for certain uh, groups, uh, which is very important as well. Um, then we have sovereignty dimension as well. And, of course, this is a, uh, about autonomy, revolves around the, 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 the subject of autonomy, which is very topical. Autonomy and independent decision-making. So, for, ex for example, the first thing that comes into our mind is the determination of priorities, research and development, which is very important because even if it's not solely uh, focusing on manufacturing, this point is very important because it's looking, for, uh, it's looking further than uh, research and development because when you can determine um, research and development, then you ha can have a voice on your own internal manufacturing. Then you have, of course... Uh, uh, we have, of course, autonomous decision on both pricing and on allocation, which is very important. There are both very important points um, about ownership of, uh, of the low and middle income countries, which are setting uh, local manufacturing. And then self-reliance, while uh, sovereignty was more about, uh, more about uh, putting something in place um, in terms of quality, in terms of uh, of subject here with the self-reliance we are looking mostly at the sufficiency at uh, the quantity level so we need to meet not just um, the local needs in terms of what they are what, of epidemiological needs for example medical needs but also in terms of quantity so we need to reach the population and we need to have a target so it can be the population uh, from the region from the country and of course, uh, self-reliance also means that we reduce dependency on external factors. Now that we have seen how important as this uh, indicators, this, um, this index of measurement, um, we can better understand how can we deliver on these objectives. Uh, these are some um, possible uh, bottlenecks that we want to address. For example, the first one, is about intellectual property rights. As we've seen with COVID-19, we should overcome many of them uh, and, uh, and solutions are um, on the table right now uh, to be discussed and public funding of R&D that should come with strings attached as well. This is very important uh, and is, uh, is delivering, of course, on the second point as we've seen on, on, uh, on sovereignty so that we can set priorities in the first place when public funding is involved and satellite sites, which should respond to the objectives of health equity is a very important point as well, because uh, otherwise uh, we don't have uh, accountability for other sites that manufacturers may set outside of their uh, headquarters countries. Um, so now we have seen uh, the parameters to measure how to ameliorate the system, but what is next on the agenda? Uh, we have in our position paper that uh, my colleague Ella um, just mentioned uh, a call for action for a global action plan, uh, which has been launched with our paper uh, in May 2023. And then we will have the World Local Production Forum, which is a very important occasion as well to uh, track progress. And it, of course, is a global platform aiming at boosting uh, dialogue and collaboration on the topic um, of regional manufacturing that may be beneficial. And then we will have the adoption of a global action plan uh, hopefully during the World Local Production Forum in November 2023, and then the pandemic accord, which hopefully again will be um, delivered in uh, May 2024. 
uh, which will be the, the, the really uh, most comprehensive instrument maybe in legislative terms. And then what we are doing as VEMUS, it's also important to stress this, uh, we are getting information to draft a report more specifically on the bio and tech mRNA facility in Rwanda. Why this? Because we also believe that these satellite sites are very important and can help delivering uh, on access to medicines in the scenario of uh, boosting uh, local manufacturing in uh, areas such as uh, the East African area of Africa. At the same time, we are looking forward to, um, to, to monitor this initiative and understand a little bit more about it uh, by gathering information. The report will then be issued in July 2023, and we are collating this work with Afiana Haki, um, a CSO from Uganda, and uh, we are collaborating with the Health Development Initiative and Great Lakes Initiative for Human Rights and Development, two other uh, um, uh, CSOs from the Global South, from uh, the African continent in Rwanda. Uh, you can also uh, take a look at our position paper, Eyes on the Prize. Uh, here is the link, and you can uh, find it on Twitter and LinkedIn, etc., as well on our social media. So I would like to thank you very much for the attention, and please uh, just uh, send any kind of inquiries to my email address if you have any kind of clarification, information, or you want to discuss anything about it. And uh, this is it. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll leave the floor to Ella. Thank you very much, Antonio. It was a great overview of the work that WEMOS does and where we stand for. Uh, I would like to go immediately to the next speaker, Professor Ter Blanche, the CEO of Effergen Biologics, a biotech company based in South Africa. Um, let me start sharing your presentation. Hello, do you want me? Good afternoon to everyone. Great to be here. Do you want me to see if I can share on my side? Is, is, is my, we, uh, my apologies, we're struggling with bandwidth at the moment. Can you see me or just hear me? We can see you and hear you, but let me share and I will, uh, and let me know when to go on to the next uh, slide. Yeah. That might Thank be you very much. Yes. Thank you. Um, can everybody see my slides? This way, sorry. Mm. I was able to see it, Ella. Okay, that's good. Um. Are you, a yes, you're, you're able to see it now? I can see it. Can anyone, everybody else see it? I assume we can continue. Yes, we can see the slides. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, Antonia, thank you for a great introduction. And maybe we can get the slides on full screen mode. Ella, can you do that? On presentation mode. Is it working like this? Yes, that's great. Thank you, if everybody can see it. So I, I, I want to offer a few perspectives on uh, on uh, enabling regional manufacturing capacity and I'm asking a few questions. Are we winning? And I'll um, and I hope to stimulate some further discussion uh, later in the session. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, we all know, and this is this is the topic topical issue for all of us that uh, global vaccine manufacturing is centralized in a few regions. So we can look at this as a barrier, or we can look at this as an opportunity. And it was very clear in se several occasions previously, also in the COVID nineteen pandemic, that demonstrated that uh, that could be a complicating factor for equity and access. Um, next slide, please. And of course, if we look at um, the synergies between vaccination, and these, these are complex issues, but there were some synergies around uh, countries that were able to manufacture and move fast um, and uh, get, get, give access to vaccines versus countries that does no capability. And often it is true that uh, companies and countries that does not have, cap and regions that doesn't have capability to manufacture and vaccines also may have and has a suboptimal ecosystem to support the distribution of those vaccines. Vaccines. Uh, we've heard many people say it's not vaccines that saves lives, it's vaccination. Um, and it is true that, that manufacturing capacity also stimulates ecosystems around um, those, those products. Next slide, please.
So uh, we've been here before. This, these are one of the barriers that we have seen before, and this is the influenza uh, case, which then again WHO and partners uh, put tech transfer in place, and and were able to deliver on on many many vaccine doses for influenza. But ten years later, we're in exactly the same position, and somewhere somehow this barrier needs to become an opportunity for us to never again have situation appearing again. And I think what is happening now with the global efforts and the energy and the, and the momentum that's put into local manufacturing, um, this, this, is, um, this is an opportunity for us like never, never, ever before. Next slide, please. This is this is agenda um, WHO um, agenda items critically around strengthening uh, health production of medicines and other technologies. The questions we're asking now: This was 2022 uh, progress will be reported. Well, this was 2021 progress will be reported this year. Where are we? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm going to use the case study, and Antonio, thank you for highlighting that earlier in this the mRNA technology transfer program headed up by WHO and, and being uh, enabled also by my medicines patent pool and the many, many partners in Europe um, uh, uh, fostering and supporting this program. This is a very, very unique network of, of, of companies. This is, the, this is a technology transfer program, a technology development and a technology transfer program that will enable 15 div different entities in low middle income countries to be able to produce vaccines, mRNA-based vaccines. Um, this is a unique portfolio of, of companies which are some public private, some private, um, and, and some public companies uh, joining in a network to enable capacity development across um, uh, low and middle income countries straddling four continents. Probably the biggest technology transfer and technology development program in the history of the world. And it was born out of a response to the pandemic and a commitment to have never again have to face a shortage of vaccine supply, not only for pandemic um, situations, but also for routine vaccines and neglected diseases. Next slide, please. So this is these are a few key points around the slide. Um, one of the barriers um, in this program was no access to technology, not able to in the in the midst of a very, very um, uh, uh, intense period of COVID-19, being able to access technology. Here, the opportunity was to develop the technology. And what this has done is it has created a platform for innovation for low middle income countries. This platform, which is an end-to-end -end mRNA platform for vaccine development, um, vaccine discovery, development, and production of, of, of clinical trials materials in a package of good manufacturing practices and transfer to multiple companies is, has formed the core of a long-term program driving sustainability. And what has also enabled us without having a technology transfer is to develop own intellectual property, which will be accessible to these, these partners in the program and to for us to innovate around this platform. Looking at the challenges of cost of goods, looking at the challenges of thermal stability, looking at freedom to operate where intellectual property may be a barrier to access, and most of all, creating an end to end platform for vaccine innovation and developing new candidates. This is at the core of the mRNA a technology transfer program and will, and, and will ensure that there is long term sustainability on a multi product pers uh, perspective. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is an important point that I want to make around the uniqueness of this program. I think, Antonio, you mentioned earlier, it is unique. This program is unique in, in many ways. So WHO and Partners has put really a strategic, uh, unique and high in, impactful uh, program together, um, which, which has to succeed. Firstly, this is unique because it's not bilateral technology transfer. The technology transfer happens from a center to multiple partners. Secondly, the technology transfer is, is a program, which a process which start only already in the early stages of knowledge generation while we are moving forward to develop full GMP scale processes, scale up process, commercial batches, and transfer turnkey into end technology to our partners. A very unique program driven by access and speed and long term sustainability. Next slide, please. 
I want to share some of the progress. I think we, we missed a slide. So the, the, the question then is, what progress have we, we made? If we look at this map, and courtesy Medicines Patent Pool and the teams is putting this data together with the help of Clinton Health, UNICEF, and many, many other partners, uh, also African Union and African CDC. If we had looked at the African continent prior to COVID, we would see a very few... Uh, dots for vaccine manufacturing, mostly all the technologies um, and, and very few vaccines, only meeting 1% of the continent's needs in vaccine supply. If we look at the African continent today, what do we see? We see a number of initiatives. We're seeing large, highly successful companies like Moderna and BioNTech moving into the continent, setting up capabilities and operations in the continent. We're seeing from, from many, many territories like China um, and, and, and other areas, partnerships where uh, technology is shared technology is starting to be transferred and we'll be building capacity for the continent. Many, many different initiatives. And I think at some point we counted more than 17. Next slide, please. We see the same happening now in Latin America with Brazil and Argentina, of course, part of the mRNA hub program, but here more and more initiatives with many, many partners uh, from many regions in the world coming together, uh, looking at opportunities to localize manufacturing um, on this continent and also to boost uh, equity and, and vaccine supply and of course, economic development. Next slide, please. And if we now move to Wipro and Cero, we see the same picture, multiple, multiple partnerships coming together, many different platforms, not only mRNA, other platforms relevant for diseases, disease targets where mRNA would not be suitable. Many activities in, in these core regions of low and middle income countries are happening as we speak. Next slide, please. And this, of, of course, in India, BioE, our partner there for the, for the partnership, but many, many initiatives also in mRNA, but also other platforms, capacitating and enabling uh, vaccine manufacturing and vaccine innovation in, in low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. So questions, and I think the debate that's coming, starting to, to happen and that's coming around is, will all of these be real? There are so many initiatives. There are great partnerships, and some are in early stages and others are embedded in, in, in later stage. Will they be ready for the next pandemic? Will they be ready for the next epidemic? Will they be ready to address some of the current healthcare needs that low and middle income countries faces, which are some of the neglected diseases, which are not priorities and which are very difficult to develop in high, for high income and high income countries? Uh, I thank you very much, Professor Terblanche, for your pres excellent presentation and overview. Uh, of everything ongoing with the mRNA hubs, etc., and the, all, all the global initiatives that are ongoing, it was really interesting. I would like to, I would like to go to the next speaker, uh, which is Dr. Moses Malumba from uh, the the Director General, the founding Director General of Afiana Haki. Dr. Malumba, are you here? Yes. Yes. Do you hear me well? Kindly confirm. I I hear you. Yes, but I, I am here. Do you hear me well? Yes. I don't Hello? see you yet. Hello. 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 We hear you. Do you hear me? I can hear you very well. Okay. Yes, we hear you. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. There you are. Okay. Go ahead. So I am. I may, I may have a problem with the internet, so I'll keep the video off. The connection sometimes is terrible. And in case you're losing me, kindly let me know. That's Hello? fine. Thank you. Yes. Should I go on? Yes, go on, please. Yes. Okay. So, so thank you so much. I want to thank the previous speakers for making such powerful statements and statements that are very relevant every single day. I, I come from Africa, I come from Uganda, and uh, the conversations on access to vaccines are, are very important. But I think before even reach vaccines, the whole conversation on manufacturing medicines 
um, on the continent is critically, critically important for the continent. I think the continent where I come from, we still produce uh, some of the lowest. We are almost net importers and beneficiaries of uh, uh, importation. For a very long time, um, India, Brazil, and the rest of the developing countries have been um, areas where we receive our medications. And when COVID hit, I think the reality set in. Some of the serious questions that we faced at the time were at what uh, point in time would we raise as priority communities? Because I think everyone was struggling to make sure that they receive what um, they need to, to, to be able to survive. And the questions of manufacturing came back as very Sometimes you're breaking up uh, now, Dr. Balumba. Long time we've talked about it, but it's not something that we've prioritized for, for many years. So, as as net importers almost, I, I don't know. Dr. Maluma, we have difficulty I'll hearing you now. To, You're breaking up. Uh, We're connection difficulties. You hear me now? Hello? It's sometimes breaking up. Let's Hello? give it, an, if you can give it another try. I, I don't hear anything now, so I would suggest we go on to the next speaker, maybe, because um, it is difficult to uh, to hear you at the moment, Dr. Baluma. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, let's go to the next speaker and see afterwards if, uh, if the connection is, is better. Thank you very much, Dr. Moses Malumba. Uh, the next speaker uh, will be Ademola Osigbesan from Head of Strategic Sourcing and Supply at Unitaid. Uh, he uh, will be replacing Robert Matiru, who was in the end uh, not uh, able to join today. So please, uh, Ademola Osigbesan, introduce yourself and um, go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, loud and clear. Great. Um, my name is Ademola Oshibe, so I bring greetings from United. Um, I am technical manager, strategic sourcing and supply. Um, and sorry, just a second. Can you still hear me? Yes, I still hear you. Yes. Um, I do hope um, I'm actually in a little bit of a noisy place. So I hope that there is no not much of background noise. It's okay. You're loud okay. and clear. It's okay, great, going. great. Thank you. Um, so I bring greetings from leadership and the team at United. I'm actually on the call with two other colleagues, um, Desi Dalton and Anita Gadrashinas. Um, I I am Ademola Oshibe, a technical manager, strategic sourcing and supply at United, and I will just be speaking very briefly on United's approach and strategy on a market-based approach to enhancing domestic and regional manufacturing capacity in Africa. You know, just to start, a, a brief um, summary on UNITED. Um, UNITED is a multilateral hosted by the WHO, and our three key strategic objectives are accelerating the introduction and adoption of key health products um, to LMICs, um, and in, in so doing, we, we complement this with the other two strategic objectives of creating systematic conditions for sustainable, equitable access and to foster inclusive and demand-driven partnerships for innovation. And the subject of today um, actually cuts across these three strategic um, objectives um, with a little bit more focus on, on looking at sustainable, equitable access to health products especially innovative health products that we focus on um, accelerating access to in, in, the, in the course of our work. 
just to give a bit of a history on, on Unity, and I'll be very brief on this. We have we work we have historically um, worked starting in 2006 on on HIV and co-infections, but then progressively uh, moved to work in TB, malaria, um, and more 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 recently, women and, and children's health, and also contributed significantly to the response um, to COVID-19, and and in so doing. Um, beginning to expand our work uh, to global health emergencies. Uh, some of our cross-cutting initiatives that um, some stakeholders will know about UNITAID is our work supporting um, the medicines patent pool. We actually founded and spun off the initiative and also our collaboration with WHO pre-qualification program for, for a while now, over a decade. Talking about manufacturing in, in ML, LMICs more broadly. Um, one thing about Unity Project is in, in the quest to accelerate access um, to affordable quality assured health products, we have consistently worked with manufacturers, um, often in, in, in India and China and other parts of um, the global north in, in certain cases. But in other cases, we've, we've actually, um, also worked with uh, African manufacturers specifically uh, to give a few examples between 2015 and 2022, we've worked on some of these products on the screen with different initiatives ranging for from product development for products like pediatric TB medicines, um, pediatric um, dolutegravir, but also certain other in, in interventions like upgrading quality of African manufactured products like sulfadoxin pyrimethamine, which we've done in, in Nigeria and Kenya with, with, with African manufacturers, um, and, and also tech transfer, which we did in collaboration with, the, with FIND um, to, to, to support the tech transfer of COVID antigen tests to Institute Pasteur Dakar. Now, why strengthen regional manufacturing now? I, 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 I would always like to point out at this time that as UNITAID, we actually started our work in, in, in the face of regional manufacturing pre-COVID. But the good thing is that this has now become more topical and we're quite excited to see great initiatives. And we're also taking lessons from such initiatives as that which um, Professor Petra has, has just um, described. But, but, but I think some things are very clear. The timing is right. Um, um, our own strategy as United has also clearly outlined the type of work we would want to do in, in regional manufacturing, strengthening regional manufacturing. And we see, as, as everyone has mentioned on this webinar today, that this is very high on the agenda of low and middle income countries, scale up partners and policymakers more broadly. But I think most importantly is that there is renewed interest from the private sector. A lot of, before now, a lot of manufacturers have become, had become jaded and skeptical about collaborating in this area. Um, but we are seeing very strong interest um, permeating the space, especially coming from manufacturers in, in, in Africa and Latin America. So we see this as a, as a, as a point in time that there is a lot of hope. Now, Coming back to our work as UNITED and how we have collaborated on lessons that we've learned over the years, I think there are certain pillars that there are certain issues that have actually come up very strongly. Um, and these um, have been represented in different ways by earlier speakers. But I think three things stand out very clearly that need to be coordinated in, in a harmonized fashion to strengthen regional manufacturing um, in, in, in different contexts. Uh, one is the intellectual property and technology. The other would be quality assurance and regulatory systems. And the third would be procurement and market shaping. And we believe strongly that, you know, by a careful um, management and, and, and leveraging these three levers, we're able to do a lot more. And just to also highlight some of the lessons that we've learned over the, the years is that regions and countries should really go beyond um, nationalistic concepts and, and, and constructs to support establishing of regional value chain in the re medium and long term. And really, just as I mentioned earlier, a market-based approach is required 
and coordination should always follow a differentiated approach, optimizing capabilities at country, regional, and continental levels. We need more cooperation and we need more context specific interventions. And, and finally, and definitely not the least important, just looking at you know, the future and looking at the environment, the, 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 the shift um, to more distributed manufacturing across continents also would give opportunities for leapfrogging into more environmentally friendly uh, manufacturing approaches. At United, we are leveraging all this um, in alignment with our strategy. Um, and we're, we're working to leverage our current projects and, um, and um, collaborations to identify opportunities that lend themselves to regional manufacturing and use this as Pathfinder projects um, to ensure that we are able to demonstrate um, this market-based approach. So to be very concrete, we are basically, for example, in our area of work in in maternal health, postpartum hemorrhage, we are now doing some clear landscapes to identify um, opportunities to support manufacturers um, in Africa, potentially, and even considering um, opportunities that may, may show up in other uh, continents um, to identify manufacturers that we could support to improve um, the, ma their manufacturing process to get a cost competitive quality assured product and also by so doing increased manufacturing capabilities like the capabilities for further injectable um, manufacturing beyond um, vaccines and biologics. So in, in doing this, we've actually identified some opportunities and some framework that we work, we're working by and that's coordinating with regional and continental um, stakeholders. And this is an illustrative um, representation of what we, we've described as a differentiated coordination that would support and, strength and, and provide a platform for regional manufacturers to key into um, activities within the global health space um, and, and, and beyond. So looking at leveraging the strength that already exists, I like, I like the earlier presentation that talked about the fact that we're not starting from zero um, and ensuring that from a regulatory perspective, much of the work that we're doing to strengthen regulatory systems are actually met with procurement and, and uh, aligned with procurement mechanisms and to ensure that as we go up into regional economic communities and regional harmonization initiatives, we're able to also match this with procurement and match this with market shaping such that when manufacturers uh, offer to invest in, in these areas and, and work on, this, on, on products, we're able to ensure that they do not have to wait extensively to start to get procurement opportunities. Um, just to give a quick summary of, of how we are, are, are seeing this at United, we would continue our work um, using the market-based approach, identifying projects within um, our portfolio that would lend themselves to, to viable markets, um, that can be used to introduce and optimize the, the current operations of regional manufacturers and build this into um, in initiatives that we can also use to strengthen capabilities more broadly. So we'll be working within our existing investment, our work with WHOPQ, our work with Medicines for Malaria Ventures, our work with the Medicines Patent Pool, um, also optimizing some of the work we've done on COVID-19 diagnostics, and HIV self-testing. We would be building partnerships, working through regional institutions. Um, and we do believe that there, there would be a lot of need to anchor things in these institutions to then galvanize efforts by countries. Um, we continue to convene um, industry partners and create a, a meeting point for, for technology exchange, for support um, through, um, normative organizations like the WHO, and we've seen these begin to yield um, some dividends, uh, and we would continue to pursue product-specific opportunities. So currently we're looking at our PPH portfolio, we'll be looking at our malaria portfolio, and other portfolios, uh, diagnostics portfolio to identify immediate opportunities. But while doing this, we would also look at cross-cutting opportunities that do exist. Um, we do understand that you know, Africa needs to do more in, in the area of, you know, shared services like, you know, product development partnerships that do exist at the global level, for example. Um, also, we're looking at just 
being able to map the capabilities along the value chain for both medicines and diagnostic. Um, and we will continue to do work at looking at how to leverage our strengths and capabilities in market shaping to further strengthen the competitiveness of manufacturers in, in Africa and potentially Latin America. To give just a very high level snippet of um, status update, we've done a lot in, in, in the past couple of months from the beginning of our new strategy. Um, we've convened manufacturers, we've actually engaged um, in, in, in factory visits, we've, we've, we're, we're, we're preparing a lot in terms of collaborations. Uh, we are we also in collaboration with the Ministry of Health of India um, you need, and, and find convene the G20 delegates to advocate for stronger support for regional manufacturing of diagnostics. I think one important point also is that there's a lot of efforts going on in vaccines. There's, there's increasing efforts in diagnostic in, 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 in therapeutics, but we're trying our best to make sure that we also, in partnership with partners like Fine, bring the conversation on diagnostics up to, to the, the continental stage and in, in, in Africa and, and also in the Powell region and trying to see how we can collaborate across these regions. Um, and and uh, finally, we're also looking at how to start to make a case, as, especially on the issues of cost premiums on the issues of impact beyond um, health um, and looking at how to put together the right models, peer reviewed um, knowledge tools that could help us make the case a strong, a much stronger case for regional manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for your excellent presentation. Ademola Osik Besan. And interesting to have these insights also on this on the on behalf of Unitate. Um, there are some questions already in the chat, but I would like to propose to go first uh, to the last speaker and then use the final half hour uh, or yeah, the final part of the session of uh, to uh, pose these questions. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Tishu Dong, unit head of the local production and assistant unit of the World Health Organization. Please uh, introduce yourself and um, very welcome. Thank you. Uh, first, let me thank the organizer for this very kind invitation for this interesting uh, webinar. So I'm Ji Cui Dong, the unit head for local production and assistant unit in WHO headquarters. So local production and assistant unit is a WHO routine uh, unit representing WHO in working with partners and also, also member state in promoting local production and facilitating technology transfer to improve access. Um, if we see the concept of local production has been mentioned in WHA, World House Assembly since 1970. So it's not something new. And the WHO has been working with the partners and the member states in strengthening local production since then. But in 2008, there, is very important, there was a very important resolution it's called Global Strategy and Plan of Action on Public Health and the, um, Innovation and Intellectual Property. This resolution um, aimed to stimulate new thinking to promote local production, technology transfer, and um, uh, need-based uh, innovation capacity building to improve access. So local production and the technology transfer, uh, again, another highlight in all the discussion during that period. Then at that time, local production and assisting unit was called local production program. So we have, uh, we conducted a series of landscape studies on local production and technology transfer for different product type. And we did several case studies to want to leverage the experience for certain countries on promoting local production to improve access. Also during that period, we have been supporting UA, uh, AUC under the leadership of uh, AUC 
in working with partners in promoting uh, PMPA and in the implementation of PMPA, we conduct a series of activities with partners. And so the year go to the 2019, there was a very important event. It, um, my program, like the development, the first interagency uh, statement on promoting local production, which was signed by the top leadership of six agencies, WHO, UNAIDS, UNIDO, UNCTAID, UNICEF, as, and the Global Fund. It was launched by our DG during the WHA that year. So during the 2019, WHO had the transformation. By that year, our program um, transferred into local production and assistant unit. So under this unit, we have a three overarching mandate in promoting local production and the technology transfer. So number one is a global coordination and a partnership. So under this, we have the World Local Production Forum. So uh, my unit is the secretariat of this forum. And also my unit is the secretariat of the WHO um, Technical Advisory Group for Local Production and the Technology Transfer. So the number two category is the country and the regional support and, uh, and uh, for local production and technology transfer. Under this, we, uh, we use our tool, ecosystem assessment tool to support a member state to assess the ecosystem um, to ensure the quality and sustainable local production. And also under this category, we also support the member state to develop the strategy and the roadmap in promoting local production and strengthening um, technology transfer to import access. And we also organize a series of training capacity building technical assistance. For instance, maybe some of you know, since 2020, each year we organize one GMP training marathon. So every year, more than 1,000 participants from WHO six regions, including manufacturers and regulators and relevant government officials attended this training. So collectively in 2020, uh, since 2020, um, more than 3,500 has been trained on the update GMP knowledge by this GMP training marathon. And we also organize holistic training workshop to have a member state to understand promoting local production and technology transfer need a holistic approach. In those workshops, including quality, uh, quality assurance, regulatory issue, licensing, technology transfer, IP issues, procuring supply chains, so it's really from uh, from city value chain from A to Z. Talk about how use this comp comprehensive approach in promoting local production. We just came back from Kigali, and there we organized a workshop for African region for all the um, countries who are invite uh, who are already producing vaccine or intended to invest in vaccine production. So 11 countries attended this workshop. It's talking about the quality assurance, the GMP, CMC, and also dossier preparation. Also talking about the ecosystem, how government and, and the regulator and the manufacturer can work together to achieve the sustainable quality local production. We also provide a tailored technical assistance. For instance, we do the GMP audit and we do CMC support and then um, provide um, um, analysis for particular uh, manufacturers. Then they, they could develop, develop their GAPA plan. We also provide hands-on training for them based on their deficiencies. Under the country and the regional support for local production and technology transfer, we also develop a lot of resources 
And uh, for instance, um, last year we updated the technology transport guideline, which was adopted by ECSPP established uh, expert committee. And this updated guideline was published Q1 this year, which provide guidance for manufacturer who would like to uh, conduct technology transfer. So this guideline will be, uh, even though it's targeted on pharmaceuticals, but the principle can be applied to vaccines and IVDs. So we also um, publish a lot of uh, like Q&A documents for GMPs. And also very soon in June, we have a new program. It's called Week of Quality. During this week, uh, we were talking about the origin of a specification for vaccine, medicine, and uh, IVDs. Currently, if you visit our website, you can see the res registration started already. And in September, we will organize this year's GMP training marathon. So you are very welcome to attend it if you are interested. So the third category of our work, if we say, is very specific. It's called PQ-EOL Related Specialized Technical Assistant. PQ is pre-qualification, EOL is emergency use listing. So for that, what we do is really to work with the manufacturers and to help them to speed up the process to achieve WHP, Q, and EUL. So under certain agreement, of course, they have a, a eligibility test and also have a prioritization models for those who, were, um, who could receive this specialized hacking assistant so we will go to the uh, companies, we do the MOOC GMP inspections. We will work with them on the chemistry and uh, manufacturing and the control, help them to prepare the um, CTD dossiers. So it's a full set of a package to help them, prepare them, get ready to WHO EOL. This year we have a very specific program on IBDs for uh, TB, uh, IVD manu uh, manufacturer support. So we selected a few manufacturers apart from our routine work on PQ, EU and related technical assistant, those companies will receive a very concentrated technical assistance. So having said that, we are mentioned of a world local production forum. The first one was organized in 2021. After the adoption of the WHO resolution 74.6 um, uh, for strengthening local production, which was a virtual one, but attended uh, by more than 100 member states, high level uh, representatives with our partners and the academies, uh, civil societies, and also all the stakeholders. And uh, uh, this year, we were organized the second World Local Production Forum. Our Netherlands will be the hosting country. Since last year, we, we, were have, we have been working with the government of Netherlands uh, in, in the preparation of the second World Local Production Forum. So one topic on regional production will be also discussed during that forum. So I also want to take this opportunity to thank the government of Netherlands for their strong support and collaborations. So I will stop here and uh, happy to join the panel discussion later with the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tisui Dong from the World Health Organization. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, do not see Dr. Moses Malumba again in the session he was looking for a place with better reception internet reception better bandwidth uh, if he will join and uh, later i will still give him the floor or uh, we can discuss some of the questions that are being posed in the chat in the meantime i saw andreas wolf uh, with the question i remember a lot of enthusiasm in the mid 2000s for local production on arvs in africa to sustain the hiv hiv program 
but little seems to have materialized, right? Can you say what lessons learned should be important to be more successful this time? Uh, it doesn't say to whom the question is. I don't know if anyone of the speakers uh, would like to respond to this question. Um, I see um, Professor Terblanche. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to respond. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Andreas, yes. I think this is one of the case studies. Um, we you know the HIV case study is, is material to, to many things that we, we have to get right. Um, so in the late, late 19s, early 2000s, you know that access to antiretrovirals for the African continent, and particularly South Africa with a high burden of disease, became problematic. And you know there was even the, the case where the South African government took the pharmaceutical industry to court to get access to technology. So the barriers and the challenges at that time was a transfer of technology. And then secondly, in 2010, a major initiative was launched in South Africa to look at uh, the socioeconomic benefits of localizing ARV production. And um, in short, I think part of the reasons why that program did not succeed was the same debates we have today. Are we prepared to pay a premium for local production, a, a short term premium, five or six years to ensure to, to establish the capacity? Can we compete on quality and 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 cost with with the, with the big Indian manufacturers? How do we get access to technology? Um, so, so in terms of antiretrovirals, so, so that, that's probably one of the biggest public health tenders in the world. And even today, we have Aspen as a key player in supplying antiretrovirals, but the actual API is manufactured outside of the country. So some secondary manufacturing uh, in South Africa, uh, external manufacturing. So a, a great lesson for us, and I assure you, we are revisiting some of the lessons um, from that time to ensure that we don't repeat them. Thank you very much. I would like to ask every panel member, actually every speaker, to turn on the camera so we can also uh, see who is willing to answer questions. Um, we had some more questions. Let me see. I, I really like this question by Esther Nakazi. Uh, do the speakers think we shall hit the tar uh, hit the set target of having at least sixty percent of medicines vaccines? or vaccines used in Africa, manufactured on the continent by 2040? And if not, what, yeah, um, what needs to be done or what could, could uh, what's the, what are, the, what will be done? Is there anyone who would like to respond to that question? Let me go again. And I'm, 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 su I'm sure Jishu from WHO would also want to contribute there. Esther, it's an ambitious target. Um, and, and I think we've debated many times, what will it take to do that? Um, what where we are is we're going to go absolute with full momentum to put an ecosystem in place to build the partnerships to have these initiatives in Africa succeeding so that at least on the vaccine side I can talk about I think at Imola might very much be able to talk about di diagnostics and other medicines um, we we are going to full speed to hit that target um, and I had the privilege earlier today to meet the new DG of, of, of Africa CDC. And I can tell you there's a lot of energy and a lot of commitment uh, from the African Union and, and, and the governments uh, to, to drive for that target. And we have good partnerships. So I'm, I'm positive. I think let's keep going as, as, as best as possible. Thank you very much. Adamola, please go Thanks ahead. Thanks so much, Prof. And I would say exactly the same. The, the targets are ambitious. Um, but definitely with with a regional approach with create with a, with a focus on creating partnerships and regional value chains shared services like what we what, what's going on with, with Afrigen, we're definitely on the right track um there are also other initiatives going on there there are some questions in the group on regulatory initiatives so definitely the African medicines regulatory harmonization project are, are, are moving at an at a good enough enough pace maybe they haven't been communicating well enough and some of these are being discussed as we speak but also beyond that we're having regional initiatives like the pooled procurement mechanism which actually i'm speaking from the venue of the waho pooled procurement um, mechanism and this has also been discussed here on how to ensure that these mechanisms are used um to 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 strengthen regional manufacturing and as much 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 unlike what has been done. Some of the lessons learned is also, this is being done in collaboration with industry. So as I speak, we have the West African Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association in the room, providing insights into 
what the role of each stakeholder is here. And so definitely with these type of momentum, um, we, we only need to you know, get more into the real activities of ensuring that the shared services, the incentives to ensure cost com competitive manufacturing, optimizing systems for the um, production capacity for manufacturers, um, and, and given some measure of preference to manufacturers from a procurement perspective, we will get there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jutsu Dong. You're on mute still. Okay, thank you. I should say it is an exciting target. This is all we work for uh, to get it, to get there. So if we want to say, maybe we need to think about how can we get there? So one thing I want to highlight is the ecosystem is very important. If we want to achieve this very um, fast, uh, how to say, uh, very uh, exciting uh, target and also this uh, great goal. So ecosystem, uh, one thing is like a policy co coherent like the different sectors, for instance, health, industry, trade, finance, and all this uh, sector need to work together to build a conducive ecosystem. This is very important to uh, allow uh, all our effort to achieve this target. Another thing I should mention the capacity building for the skilled, um, skilled uh, personnel in our continent, particularly in Africa continent, to achieve this, we really need huge um, skilled uh, human capital to support this development of uh, this uh, sector development. I stop. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we had some questions related uh, to the uh, market based, based approach. We try directed to Adamola. I saw you're responding in the chat as well. Uh, I saw in the chat Oscar Lanza ask, asking, are we really interested and happy to adopt a market-based approach in these initiatives? And El Storelo asking similar questions about uh, the reality that many low and middle income countries health needs represent market failures and that even market push and pull may not be able to correct it. Um, could you please comment on which type of market failures can, in principle, be addressed through market-based approach and what the limitations are for this approach and what should we do differently for other health needs? I don't know, Ademola, I saw you respond already in the chat, but it might be nice to also uh, highlight uh, it here in, uh, in, as well. Um, thank you very much. I, I think really um, from speaking to manufacturers directly uh, and also from just the general activities that have gone on with a lot of partners. And I think that's one of the beginning, the, the, the major points here is that there's a lot of uh, assessments that have gone into the sector. And what we need now is to start to act on some of those findings. Uh, already Dr. Dr. Dong mentioned one of some of the issues, um, the cost drivers for manufacturers, uh, you know, low resource optimization, um, HR in some cases, um, API cost variability across manufacturers based on volumes um, of their demand based on their their unpredictable markets um, and, and 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 those are some very concrete things that if the continent and sub regions can come up with shared shared support services um, and and coordinated approaches and and just some having to influence. So when we say market-based, we're also not necessarily saying free market, we're only saying harnessing the market and ensuring that we're able to then incentivize or influence the market in a very time-limited manner and not necessarily having to sustain subsidies or having to sustain um, interventions for, for much longer period. So I think you know, talking about that and part of what I put in the chat was also selecting the product carefully. There are certain products that the markets are quite concentrated. So for malaria, for example, with a third of the malaria burden in Nigeria uh, and 95% on the continent of Africa, I think it just makes sense that having an approach that tries to leverage that um, concentrated market and ensuring that we're able to optimize the operations of manufacturers in that area 
and also explore opportunities to backward integrate. Some of the things that are emerging that we're beginning to see and we're very proud of, for example, is the fact that manufacturers are also seeing, now seeing the need to collaborate. So there are a few announcements that we're waiting to see, for example, in Africa, of manufacturers coming together to form syndicates to set up API manufacturing. In such a situation, then they will be able to optimize their, their, the, 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 the um, capacity of such facilities and be cost competitive much early, earlier and easier than wanting to be individually backward integrated as, you, as they would have needed to do um, if they were going to go uh, on, on this by themselves. So definitely there are opportunities to then support some of these initiatives to make sure that when this come on stream within our established global portfolio and global partners are also speaking together, we're able to optimize. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know, Dr. Dong, if, if you still want to respond to this question or if your hand is, is uh, for the previous question. Um, oh, you're still on mute. It's a legacy hand. I'm sorry for that. No, no worries. I saw a question by Alice Abadi, how to address the fact that buying from new and smaller manufacturers from low and middle income countries might be more expensive, at least in the initial stages and that these manufacturers will have to compete with local branches of bigger manufacturers, often from the West or East, now opening branches in low and middle income countries. Is there any of you um, I saw I'll, also who would I'll like start. to respond? Yeah, go, I'll go start ahead. on this one, Ella. I think it's a fundamental question, and it also circles back to, to Elsa's uh, other question around uh, you know, does all of these decisions need to be market driven? And I, and I, and I think there's a, there's a deep debate starting to de to develop to to, uh, for example, at the vaccines. Let me use the vaccine example to actually look look at the full value. Uh, assessment for a vaccine, not just market and profitability and and um, uh, co cost competitiveness. I think there's a debate developing that we need to be innovated around the models we put forward, which will then, then enable low middle income countries to be have the capacity to develop um, and manufacture their own, own vaccines. Um, I um, I think there's there's going to be many many debates around that, and I think there's you know else can else else um, um, as is working on with, with with WHO also on models that will bring a different sustainability discussion. I think there needs to be a discussion around health impact, um, and the value of health um, in these discussions around local procurement. And I also circle to the question specifically to me around uh, government's uh, decisions in the case of the buyback versus uh, versus CIPLA uh, tender, tender uh, um, uh, case study we had recently. So we have seen before, and with antiretrovirus as part of the, of the learning, unless governments prioritize local procurement and unless there is an intention to look at socioeconomic impact in multipliers and be prepared to pay a premium of 15 or 20 percent in the early days of local manufacturing is going to be very difficult to embed foster and to nurture a new industry uh, on the continent. It is not unusual to, uh, to protect industry. It's not unusual to pay premiums on local manufacturing. It happens in Europe and high income countries for hundreds and hundreds of years. I think there is significant, I think Dr. Juicy mentioned the, the comment about policy coherence. There needs to be policy coherence in an ecosystem to nurture the local manufacturing industry um, uh, on the continent. And Africa has specific challenges but we also have specific opportunities to, to really have a, have, a, have a big impact. In terms of the buyback supply case, the, it's, it, is, it is true that governments want to procure as much product as possible to treat their people. That is a responsibility uh, in terms of this is a restricted budget. At the same time, if we have policy coherence, they will be affected in the value of local manufacturing. And I think this particular case study three weeks ago, an announcement is a turning point for governments to look at policy coherence. And my government, particularly where health, treasury, tra trade and industry are sitting together around the table with buyback and the suppliers, having a discussion around local manufacturing and sustainability. So um, it, it was it was a, a case that I think again triggered a very fundamental debate and fundamental change. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think others want to respond to this question as well or perhaps to uh, to comment on it. Um, Dr. Dong or uh, Ademola also big based on. 
I could go first. Um, yes, go ahead. So, so just to say that even on the issue of premiums, a lot of times I think our analytics haven't gone so far enough, you know, to look at all the elements. And I see a lot of partners are working on this now. So we're really looking to be able to get more industry partners ready to offer, you know, case studies that we can use to justify this further, the economic benefits, the Forex benefit, and every other benefit that we could quantify to further justify the value of the premium because a lot of times it's also about you know what is, is 10 correct is it, is it meant to be 15 or 20 percent you know what exactly can we use to justify this position on, on premium and i think it's all a, a lot more that needs to be done from a research perspective to ensure that we have the right models to justify these um and and, and ensure that we find the sweet spot on what the premium should be that would match the, the associated benefits. Over. Yes, Dr. Dong, go ahead. Thank you. And uh, I totally agree with uh, um, um, two colleagues just said. First, for all this uh, small um, new industry, so time bound incentive actually is quite a key to allow them to grow and be competitive uh, when compete with other big um, players. This is one thing. So if the government has this commitment to promote local production, to uh, safeguard the national health security, so one thing, this time-bound incentive could be considered for the industry. The second thing I totally agree, how to evaluate the impact of local production, not only the price. You see, by the promoting local production, you are also strengthening knowledge-based economy. So you increase local employment and you decrease the lead time for the supply chains. So all these factors need to consider need to consider when talking about the benefit of a local production, not only the price. Thank you. Thank you very much. I saw an interesting question from uh, Jan Hendricks uh, for Dr. Ter Blanche. Can you comment on South Africa's recent decision to procure Indian PCV vaccine at the disadvantage of Pfizer BioVax locally filled PCV? And perhaps related to that, the, the questions that Moga uh, Kamaliani posed, at least the first one, how to get governments, especially the Ministry of Finance, to accept paying higher price, building on the questions uh, and Petro's answers. I think, I think I, I, I sort of, in my previous comments, tried to answer the complexity of this. And I think that case study is, is, is uh, certainly being one of the Heat debates and turning points for South Africa, uh, and and you know I hope that that this will again create that policy coherence with different departments sit together, and that we understand the socio-economic impact and value of local production, as Dr. Lucy and Adam Mola has, has been has been describing. We've run this for antiretrovirals, the the multipliers for job creation, for direct foreign investment, GDP creation, knowledge economy, innovation. Um, uh, uh, skilled work workforce is, is enormous. Uh, and, and we know that with the ARD uh, studies we've run in 2011, one rand or one dollar investment in, lo in, in, in local production gives you a 13 to 15 dollar return, um, which is which then you can we run the numbers, you can justify some premiums for periods of time. That doesn't mean we has, have to be non competitive. Um, in, in terms of Moga's uh, question, it is. I think there again, Moga, I think civil society has played an incredibly important role to, to, to um, advocate for government departments to work together, to have a common goal and to think local and to think long term. And, and we should continue to have, to have those engagements with, with our governments and, and, and across the continent and actually across low middle income countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I don't know if anyone else would like to respond. I see also, Adamola, that your colleagues are here. If there are any questions that your, your colleagues would like to respond to, they're more than welcome to as well. 
the other questions that Moga posed was uh, self-reliance is limited. Even US companies rely on China and India for ingredients. How about multiple supplier of e ingredients? And the third question is, seems like donors, pharma, global bodies have discovered uh, local production in Africa and everyone is going with their ideas and initiatives. How can the African Union take the lead and get actions at continental level where they are in the driving seat, challenging inappropriate deals, coordinating ensuring benefits? Um, Dr. Dong, would you like to respond to I that? Could. Or is there... I could take that. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, just, just to say that within the African Union, um, the Africa, and I think Dr. Dong already mentioned that in a presentation, that the AUDA NEPAD is the arm of the African Union that is saddled with the responsibility of coordinating um, the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for Africa and other manufacturing initiatives. Um, and I believe strongly that there is an interagency team being set up within the AU um, to do to, to, to further strengthen this position and bring more coordination within the AU. So definitely there's a lot of work in progress. I think the, the challenge is that with, with, with setting up institutional um, institutions and strengthening institutional positioning, it, it just takes a while. And I, I believe that these will continue to progress um, as, as we move ahead and the AU also has delegated some of the initial initiatives to regional economic communities. So um, Wahoo, for example, is leading on pool procurement of, of, of um, pharmaceuticals and diagnostics to strengthen uh, regional production. Um, and and they're, they're doing this in a more institutionalized way. And, and we, we're waiting to see, we're supporting these initiatives and waiting to see them begin to come to fusion. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Dom. You're still on mute. Based on our experience uh, in working with the AUC in, uh, implement, in, in, in the implementation of a PMPA, uh, we are quite confident AUC takes the leadership like uh, um, um, NIPAID and other technical uh, agency within the continent. So uh, our experience, all the partner work very closely with our technical arm in AOC and the AOC leadership. So because this is a continental um, initiative, should, uh, should be led by the continent. And also uh, uh, thinking about the new initiative, like the creation of AMA, and also the African Free, uh, free Trade uh, Area, this agreement, all this build the new mechanism to arm the agent and the continent to take the lead, to lead this uh, the continent move in promoting local production to achieve their very exciting goal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're almost at the end of the webinar. And I would like to add, I'm, I, I'm afraid we didn't go through all of the questions. So we, we, I think we can still take an hour for answering and go on in this debate. It's very, it's been very interesting. And I really enjoyed the presentations by the different speakers. I would also like, if, uh, like to ask the speakers um, if there are still some final comments, some takeaway messages to round up this event. Uh, I would like to give you the floor and then um, close the event for today. Uh, let me start uh, with my colleague, Antonio Perelli. Go ahead. Yes, no, I I found the, 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 the all, all the questions uh, being very, very interesting. And of course, all the presentation to be very, very, very helpful to understand all these dimensions. I guess what we can keep in mind is always that we have many dimensions involved, many uh, pillars involved. So financial support is crucial. Coordination with uh, initiatives uh, on the continent and in the world is crucial. Uh, regulatory issues are crucial, as we mentioned uh, many times. Uh, technology transfer, regional and continental distribution, and uh, procurement and price mitigation are all aspects that have been taken into account from them's perspective and have to be there 
uh, in our mind that we keep up on the agenda. And so my idea and the Vemos idea is that uh, these are very important dimensions and that health equity, self-reliance and sovereignty must be at the backbone of our reflection for the future of it. And thank you very much again for all the questions uh, and uh, the presentations. Thank you, Antonio. Is there anyone else who would like to give a final comment? Uh, or I see Dr. Uh, Professor Ter Blanche, you're unmuting. Would you like to say something fine in the final comment? Yeah, Ella, a quick one. Uh, there's a question around how involved, involved is UNICEF, and that will maybe lead me to just two points, if I may. UNICEF very engaging and very involving, such as Gavi and Sepi. So a positive comment there. Think to that, there were two slides that I was unable to show, and if I may just take two words to the one slide, the second last slide was around how the ecosystem approach becomes now the lead. And I think all the speakers here has, has, has demonstrated that the approach here for success is certainly from an ecosystem and a multi-sectoral perspective. And then my last slide, if I may share, I have a slide which says the victory will require a global effort. And I, and I think that's, that's really the thought that I want to leave with this webinar is www.coearth, and that is cooperation, coordination, co-development, co-financing, co-existence, co-innovation, coherence, and collateral. Let's work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ter Blanche. Uh, this was really uh, great. Uh, Ademola Ozik Besson, I would say just one sentence. We're not starting from zero. Let's see the cup as partly full. I wouldn't say half full. We may not be halfway yet, but definitely we're making progress. And with every attempt would come learnings and we would continue to make progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Dong, please, the final words are for you. Still mute. Sorry. So first, thank the organizer and all the speaker for their uh, very excellent uh, remark. I like uh, Professor uh, Pedro's co co co. I would also add some co. So I would co on uh, because we know there are so many initiatives during the pandemic. Uh, it has been uh, fascinating, uh, right? To make a concrete uh, progress, I would add some more co co on. Uh, more uh, communication, more collaboration, more cooperation, and more coalition. So to, uh, to achieve our shared goal. Thank you. Great. That's a great way to end this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank all listeners all, and, and especially, of course, all speakers. And um, I would like to wish everyone a very good day the rest of the day. Thank you very much. On behalf of Wemos and all of my colleagues, Bye-bye.